Okay, so let's get started. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everyone tuned in today. Uh, I'm Akshay, and uh, with me today, I have Ashta and Amarendra, who are going to be the co-moderators for today's session. And uh, without further ado, I would like to ask our guest speaker and <coughs> the I would like to ask Randy to uh, quickly introduce himself and uh, we, we can get started. Thanks, Akshay. Nice to meet everyone. And thank you for the invite to speak at the session today. My name is Randy Kep Casal. Um, I'm a 2018 MBA graduate from MIT Sloan. Uh, spent most of my time after Sloan in consulting, a little bit with Deloitte in their uh, Boston office, and then the last three years in EY Parthenon strategy uh, here in Tokyo, with a little bit of time spent in the Web3 and the digital asset spaces along the way. Uh, so that's my quick background. I'm sure we'll go more into my uh, MBA journey in detail later, so I'll save that for later in the session. Thank you again for the invite. Um, so as for the attendees today, feel free to turn on your cameras and we would love to see everyone. I'm pretty sure Andy would like to see everyone's faces. And at the same time, um, we have compiled all the questions that all of you have sent to us. So we would still like to ask um, you all to put in your questions if you have any more uh, in the chat. And the moderators will be going through all the questions. And if time permits, we will take up those questions as well. If not, we will go ahead with the questions that we've compiled from uh, everything that's been sent. So I would like to ask Ashta to start uh, with the first question and then we will take it from there. Thanks, Akshay. Thanks, Lenny, for joining us. So uh, we would like to start off with, uh, you know, a discussion about the city of Boston. Like I've been to Boston and I love the city, like, you know, the Quincy market and all that. It's a really nice vibe. So we just wanted to know, like, you know, how did you find Boston as a city? Boston was a reasonably large part of the reason I ended up choosing MIT. I had options to go to schools uh, at other cities, um, but compared to California and uh, Chicago, Boston to me sticks out as being large enough and important enough that it has um, professional opportunities, but I love the student vibe that comes with it and the access education is unparalleled. I mean, it's really the education capital of the world being in the Cambridge Boston hub. Um, but I think your question may have been a little bit more oriented towards life there rather than just the pure academic side. Um, I, I do think it's a more pleasant place to live than really almost any of the other options. Um, the size of the city is, again, large enough that you have access to arts and culture and entertainment and a vibrant social life. Um, but at the same time, it's manageable. It's not overcrowded like New York City. It's not too expensive the way San Francisco is. Um, and it's not as brutally cold as Chicago, although it is still quite cold in the winter. The winters are harsh. I will admit that. Um, but the, the summer is gorgeous. The spring is gorgeous. And you have access to the entire rest of the Northeast as well, and also New York City, if you want to, it's just a 90 minute two hour bus ride. So uh, for me, it was a perfect fit. I wanted to be in Boston relative to all the other uh, MBA hubs out there. Thanks, thanks, Andy. that really helps. Okay, so, so uh, I'm actually a professor, so it's, uh, I, I was very curious about asking you this question. So. Uh, which one of the uh, of your professors at MIT would you think had the most profound impact on you in terms of you know uh, like uh, the teaching and his personality and their you know uh, the overall way of uh, uh, teaching you? I mean, who had the most profound in impact on you? I think that almost any MIT Sloan student would tell you this is a very difficult question to answer because so many of the professors are absolutely world-class. 
um, everyone's brilliant, but I think your question is a bit less about who's the smartest and who's the most innovative or has the most impactful teaching method. Um, I think there were certainly one or two professors that stood out with how interactive they were. Uh, the one that I always bring up is um, Bill Owlett, who at the time was not actually in charge of the entrepreneurship and program at MIT, but he is now. Um, I went through his new enterprises course and also went through the MIT Delta V Accelerator for startups, which he also runs. And um, very unprofessorial in his teaching method. He uses curse words from time to time. Um, he's very direct um, to try to shake you out of the mindset of this being a quiet class where you are supposed to listen and absorb. He's an entrepreneurship professor. He wants action from you. Um, and he made that very clear, right? Uh, that entrepreneurship is messy. Action is better than thinking or perfect planning. Um, and really just a character. So I think his impression was quite strong on me. Um, that's not to short sell some of the other professors um, who I had in, I mean, I can't even pick one, but um, including Nobel laureates who I got the chance to sit in the same classroom with, uh, everyone sticks in my mind, but Bill is certainly one that, that jumps out to me. Wow, that was really amazing perspective. I should keep that in mind while teaching myself. <laughs> it's it's a tool that you should use sparingly, I think. It's, it's can easily be overused, but um, in the right context, absolutely. So um, I have a question about uh, Japan. So I'm in Japan and you're in Japan. And I had my reasons when I, I chose to come to Japan. So you, after graduating in the United States, what particularly made you uh, choose to come to Japan and what was that like? Yeah, I mean, this is a chance for me to tell a little bit more about my story um, in detail. But, you know, originally there wasn't necessarily a desire to come to Japan specifically. I knew um, when I graduated, I graduated from Duke for my undergrad um, that and I was going into the military um, as an officer, but I knew that I, I didn't want to just be in the States. I wanted the maximum international experience. I really wanted to get every juice of value out of this opportunity to be um, in the military. So I pushed for an international assignment. I went right down the list of um, all international bases in my top 10 list. Japan was at the top because it was the most unique for me. Um, it was also a developed economy. So in that if I wanted to transition to the civilian world later, it would set me up the best from an economic perspective. Um, and who doesn't want to be in Japan, right? I mean, it's a, it's a unique country that no one really understands until you get here. So all of those were drivers. Um, and then I came here, spent four years and a half or so um, and then I had to make another decision of, do I want to go back to the States and continue in my military career, or do I want to stay in Japan and, and really build this out as my life? And, um, so I had to pick Japan again, a second time. Um, and, and that really came down to two reasons. Number one being, um, uh, the easy one to explain is, is personally, Japan is very appealing. Um, I contrast it with the U.S. right now. Um, the U.S. has many societal issues at the moment. Um, rampant drug use. Um, the cities are not as safe as they used to be. Um, it's like when you get to Japan, all those problems just disappear. Drug use is virtually zero. The streets are pristine. The society is healthy. It has its problems, but in terms of quality of life, it's unparalleled. It's just a place that's good to be. Um, and I enjoy it. And I've put through the effort of, of learning the language, so I'm quite comfortable here. So personally, it fit with me very well, and I wanted to continue being here. But there's also a professional reason in that in the U.S., even as an MBA graduate from a, a top MBA, 
you're still one of a fairly large population. There are thousands of smart people in the US. It's the world's headquarters for talent. Um, even people that don't go to MBA, some of the smartest people are actually the ones that don't go to MBA because they're already there. They're already at, you know, they're already an experienced product manager at Google, or they're already a um, senior associate at KKR or Carlisle, right? Why do they need to go to MBA? Um, so as an MBA student, you, um, you're in a pretty large pool of other smart people, and it's a little hard to feel your impact. But if you come to an economy that is either having some difficulties or is still growing, you actually can make an outsized impact. And I feel that very strongly in Japan, where the pool of MBAs with global experience is quite small. You're one of a very tough, small pool. Um, and I get pulled into conversations with CEOs that I would never really have an opportunity to do in the U.S. So I can feel the impact professionally um, that I can bring. And, and that's quite meaningful to me, even though, you know, my classmates are making three to 400,000 a year, I'm making far less than that being in Japan. Um, so I do take a financial sacrifice to be here, but for me professionally and personally, it's worth it. That's, that's a great uh, point. Having lived here, I think I can see what you mean. So that's, I'm, I, I'm sure. Let me, let me yes. quickly um, address Giovanni's question about 24 steps. Um, Yes, we do use it. The new enterprises course is essentially entirely focused on using the 24 steps for a business idea that you develop with teammates. Um, and I've used it after MIT as well for my other entrepreneurial endeavors. So um, it's very core to how the entrepreneur program runs at MIT. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, if you just look up Bill Aulet, and I'll put his name in the chat, his book will quickly come up, 24 Steps for Disciplined Entrepreneurship. That's what we're referring to. Thank you. So uh, our next question was about the curriculum at MIT, because I believe MIT is renowned to be uh, one of the B schools which with the most flexible curriculum. Like uh, I've heard you can take uh, classes from other MIT schools as well as uh, other universities as well. So we just wanted to understand how did you take advantage of that flexibility during your MBA? Yes, you're correct. It's extremely flexible. You only have one semester of required classes. So you have three full semesters to explore. Um, in addition to that, you have what are called winternships, the month of January where you're off. People can go out and do internships with local startups. Usually it's with other MIT alumni. So it's kind of within the extended MIT network um, to get a flavor from, from other uh, companies or industries. So you have quite a few um, opportunities to be more flexible than you would at a more typical uh, MBA program, which I, in my understanding tend to be more scripted. Um, me personally, um, I was a bit limited by the fact that I was very focused on going to Japan, uh, which forced me to forego some of the flexibility. Um, but some things I did were, I did do a few trial classes over at Harvard Business School in their macroeconomics department. Um, ultimately, the commute was a bit too painful. I didn't have a car and there was about an hour to handle the logistics of going over there. And with my heavy course load, it, it didn't make sense for me to keep doing that. But it was very easy to do that type of cross-registration. So it's quite possible for you to go over. And I had many classmates do HBS cross-registration. Um, you can also cross-register with other um, schools in MIT. You know, back when Web3 and blockchain was not really a thing, I had classmates go over to the Media Lab and work with some of the leading minds not work with, but take classes with some of the leading minds of uh, the evolving space. So that's also very accessible. Um, me personally, I, I did do Japanese classes with the MIT undergrad, but again, that's a way of me getting free Japanese tutoring because I knew I was going to go back. Um, so it certainly helped me um, get me in a structured area and also get me some exposure to the undergraduate students as well, which are the true geniuses on campus. Um, 
I think those are the main points I would mention. But again, you know, it, MIT is a platform. You have the entire MIT campus. Everything that's happening there is open to almost everyone on campus in whatever school you're in. Um, so MIT is very specific in referring to themselves as MIT Sloan, not as Sloan. The reason is that they make it very clear they're part of the MIT network um, and that you're a part of that larger community. You know, HBS doesn't do that. They refer to themselves as HBS. Yes, it's Harvard, but the BS part is actually more important. Same thing when you look at other schools, Booth or Kellogg. Um, the business school is, is very siloed in my experience. Um, so MIT is unique in that it really wants to be a part of the overall community. Thank you. So the next question would be about uh, your journey from arm, armed forces. So I come from a family of armed forces. I mean, my father was uh, an Air Force officer. So I know the kind of structure and, uh, you know, the uh, kind of discipline that armed forces people have. So uh, in terms of uh, the in terms of values, uh, the structure in the organization and the communication style, how would you say your transition from armed forces to MBA and your current role was, I mean, was it difficult? Was it uh, easy? How was it? Overall, I would say it wasn't too difficult. Uh, some veterans have more difficulty with it than others. It, it often depends on how macho the environment was where you came from. Right. I was a logistics officer, so I was very used to working in a very diverse, multi-gender environment. Um, some guys who were from Delta Force or Navy SEALs weren't in that type of environment. Right. Um, but for me personally, it wasn't too difficult. Um, I, I think one of the biggest differences that I had to realize is, in a way, respecting people's privacy and space in that um, you know, in the military, as an officer, you're expected to look out for your subordinates, not just professional lives, but to some degree, personal lives. Their health and the health of their families is your responsibility. That's not the case in the private sector, right? People consider that overreach in some ways for you to ask about, you know, private topics. So it really, I had to reset some boundaries in terms of what were acceptable ways to communicate. Um, about those type of topics. Um, so I was almost being too involved as a leader on things that I was involved in, and I needed to learn how to take a step back and, and give people more space. Um, I think people appreciate the discipline. I think people respect the sacrifice that going through military requires. Um, so you do have a bit of authority immediately stepping in the room. Um, and I think veterans also bring, they're usually the only students who have real world, true leadership experience. Most MBA students only have two to three years working experience. Maybe you're in professional services. At most, you've managed one associate. Most veterans are coming in with experience leading 50 to 300 large person teams. It's a totally different scale. So they're used to delegating, they're used to organizing, and they're used to trusting the people around them. So I think um, there are differences in the style, and veterans often can help the other students adjust to a more mature way of leadership. Um, people without that leadership experience are very susceptible to micromanagement and driving their subordinates or junior staff crazy because they don't learn how to step back or delegate properly. So in, I would almost turn the question on, on its head a little bit and say um, there are some things that normal students and civilians really can learn from veterans as well, especially around delegation and, and division of responsibilities. So um, now that we've touched up a bit about the, the MBA itself, I wanted to ask you about um, what was your favorite memory um, over the two years at Sloan, you know, in terms of your social life or personal life, it could be an academic moment too, but what has stuck out to you even years later after you've come out of maybe? The depths of the personal relationships are unparalleled. I mean, 
of course, there are moments of professional triumph when you get that job offer or you conquer a subject that you were having trouble with. Those are those are special in their own way. Um, but I do think that the the ones that stick with you are the personal moments. Um, for me, uh, I think a big moment was when I had 12 classmates who were all non-American say, yes, we want to go and see uh, your hometown, Randy, because it's a bit off of the beaten path. It's a part of America where most people don't go. It's, it's a state called Georgia in the Southeast. Maybe you've heard of Coca-Cola or these brands that are based out of there. Um, and they were interested to the point where we organized a tour down to my city with those 12 um, classmates. So very special moment to you know get to that level of connection with people. They want to see your hometown. Um, and those bonds don't, don't break down. Um, the MIT community is very much a family. Um, I've, I say this in most of the conversations that I have about Sloan, but out of the 400 people in my class, there's exactly one person who I wasn't a big fan of. Um, the other 398, myself included, were fantastic people and are akin to family for me. Uh, and I think that's the case for almost every Sloanate. Um, and just being able to have that professional cohort of people that have that level of connection with you, I think is something that um, you, you simply don't find anywhere else. You know, work colleagues are fantastic, but it's different. You're there for a job. You didn't choose to be there as part of this academic community. So for me, that's the special, most special moment is, you know, those other 398 classmates. And I think that it's almost a similar answer for every MBA student you'll talk to. That was, that was great. Thank you. Uh, so, Randy, we just wanted to know how has the MIT Sloan brand helped you so far in your journey post-MBA? Uh, immensely. Um, it, it's interesting in that, you know, you kind of expect the world to be laid at your feet when you get there. And when you start applying to jobs, you kind of expect it to go very easy. I'm a you know, top MBA student, right? This shouldn't be hard. Um, but you actually realize quite quickly that the competition for those jobs is extremely stiff. Usually, um, they're not only looking to get in IT people, they're applying or they're opening up roles to everyone uh, across the different MBA programs. Uh, so you've kind of left one competitive fishbowl and you've jumped into another competitive fishbowl. Where, where I found the most value from the brand coming when you get one or two steps actually removed from the MIT community. Um, you know, I got my internship not by applying through MIT opportunities, but actually just going directly to a company I wanted to work with and explaining who I was and saying, I want to work with you. Uh, you know, they didn't have a job opportunity posted at MIT, but the strength of the brand, uh, you know, they're, a member of their board personally walked my application through and convinced the chief HR officer to give me the opportunity to work with them. This was Suntory Whiskey, if you're familiar with Suntory. Um, I worked in their Tokyo headquarters for a while. Um, that brand power, just unprecedented, right? To be able to do that. Um, and even after uh, my job at EY Parthenon was very easy to get, the head of um, the consulting firm out here was a Sloney, uh, so that network in, built immediate trust. He didn't even give me a case interview. Um, he just essentially asked me when I wanted to start. Um, and thankfully, it worked out fine, and I didn't betray his trust. So it would have been bad if if I had been a burnout. Um, but you know, both of those opportunities were critical to me building my professional success um, and direct result of the MIT brand. So I, I think it is a, a powerful brand. Um, it I do find that the MIT part is more powerful usually than the Sloan part. Sloan is not as well known as certain schools like HBS or Stanford. But you know, the MIT part is powerful enough that it more than makes up for really anything else.
Thank you. Sure. So, Randy, the next question would be about, uh, I mean, how the MBA from MIT Sloan helped you prepare for your current role? I mean, uh, in uh, in what aspect it made you uh, prepared, well prepared for your current role? That's a difficult question to answer. I mean, there's certainly jobs which tie closely to the academic coursework, for example, some more than others. Um, my current role being consulting senior manager in a strategy firm, I mean, it's an ex extremely variable role. We get asked all kinds of questions by clients, most of which are topic areas which I have never really delved into before. So I, rather than MBA being a, a platform that gives you specific knowledge, I think the two things it offers you to prepare for this type of role is number one, um, getting you used to tackling a wide variety of subjects. An MBA is an opportunity to touch finance, supply chain, uh, accounting, product management, entrepreneurship, all at the same time. So your brain has to get very good at switching from one topic to another and being able to comment on it intelligently. Um, most people are not used to that. Most people are used to having a very specific focus. I'm a finance analyst, for example, or you know, I run supply chain for a manufacturing company. It's very tight focus. So there's a switch that has to get flipped in your brain that allows you to jump between these different topics and not be so embarrassed or lacking confidence. Uh, so I think helping me develop that muscle of touching all of the different subjects so I wasn't a complete idiot is really the first and most important uh, benefit that I got from MBA. The second one, almost as important, I think, is just getting you more exposure to um, a wide variety of people um, in a business and professional setting and, and really helping you build that social muscle. A business is so so. Um, you know, you have to be able to go to events with very senior business leaders and make a connection with someone you don't know um, and eventually market yourself and sell work for them. So that's how you build clients as a consultant. Um, so getting used to that, going in and meeting people you don't know before and building rapport with them from zero is, again, something that most people are not used to. If they are used to it, it's usually a more in a personal setting. Doing it in a business setting is is a whole different ball game. So I think that getting used to that that game and that style of interaction it was the second tangible uh, benefit that I got. Um, it is eleven thirty for you right now. So is it okay if we extend by a couple of minutes, or if you sure. have to? Uh, I'm minutes. good to go for at least another ten minutes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, so the next question is about the application itself. So the application journey involves a lot of self-reflection and introspection, right? So in terms of communicating to the school about who you truly are. So uh, from the perspective of what your journey was like when you were in that phase and looking back at it now, what advice you have for aspiring you know, applicants such as us? What 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 is the biggest takeaway that you can give us? That it's probably something that we might not have thought of. Mm -hmm. the The most important thing to understand with MIT Sloan and Akshay, this will be review for you, but I think it's a key and important point, is that MIT is much less interested in your future plans than other schools. It's most interested in understanding who you are as a person. What have you done in the last few years that demonstrates who you are and your value? And then how are you going to use it on campus for MIT and for your classmates? Uh, the reason they have this shift in focus more towards the past instead of your future is that MIT takes the perspective that they want to be a transformative experience for you. If they want to be a transformative experience for you, that means that your goals going into the program should not be the same goals that you have leaving the program. So there's no point in asking you to be very specific and detailed in your future career goals because we want those to change. 
we want you to discover a new area you, that you're passionate about and pursue that with 110% of your energy, right? So we're, we're not trying to ma make you build like your five to 10 year career plan and then execute it. Um, it's, of course, it's good to have direction, at least general direction, but it's less than having a plan and carrying it out. We want people that are genuinely passionate um, which means that they will be engaged on campus and not just a student. We want people who are entrepreneurial. So that's number one. Number two, we want people who actually can get things done. MIT takes a lot of pride in its action learning and its emphasis on action. So that's where we want to understand what have you done in the last three years to enact your passions. So not just be passionate theoretically, but be passionate actually. That's number two. And then number three, you need to be smart enough to hack it with the rest of the team. So just pure academic ability is a requirement as well. Um, not academic in that you need to have perfect test scores, but you need to have a certain brightness and intelligence to let you engage with the material there. Um, so then the last one I would mention is, uh, again, you need to bring all of these qualities to your teammates, not for your benefit only, but for the MIT ecosystem and for your classmates. So we want people who are very collaborative. So those are the things you should focus on demonstrating in your application. Don't try to demonstrate your or explain in detail your long-term plan and kind of your career steps that you want to get there. Rather than that, explain to us what you're passionate about who you genuinely are and how you're going to bring that genuine, passionate personality to campus and, and make as a whole the ecosystem a better place. I, I think that's really the number one most important thing. The number two thing I would slightly mention, which is um, connected to just how to approach the experience as a whole, um, don't try to put a mask on. People realize very quickly at MIT, we wanna see your genuine self. And that includes the bad as well as the good. We had a session, it was a monthly session where we would have classmates come up and tell their most painful, personal, embarrassing stories to the entire class. We want people's masks to come down so we really get to know each other. Flaws and perfections. Again, I think that's very different than other programs where people are often trying to keep a professional uh, face on. MIT is very different. We want to connect with you genuinely as a person. Thank you. Hi, Randy. This is Naman here. Sorry. Uh, uh, I, I have an interesting question. So with your uh, undergrad at Duke, uh, why did you choose MIT over FUCOA? Biggest reason is that the MIT branding overseas is immeasurably more powerful. Um, Duke is, is an excellent school, but it's very much a US brand, not a global brand. Whereas MIT is a global brand known universally. That's the biggest reason. Number two, I would never recommend someone to do both their masters and their undergrad at the same university. I would always recommend expanding your network going to a different institution and getting a different perspective. So that was a second reason. I, I love Duke, but I really didn't want to go back to Durham. And, you know, it would feel like a repeat of undergrad for me. I wanted something different. And then lastly, the third point, my time at Duke was very qualitative. I was a classics major and philosophy major. I needed something technical to balance out that background. Um, I hadn't expected to be going into business. Business is becoming much more quantitative every day. Um, I wanted to have that MIT name behind me to prepare me for this new world that we're living in. Yeah, Ashta. Hi, Hi Randolph. Uh, I'm Varun. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. I have a question regarding the LGO at MIT. So uh, by profession, I'm a product manager working in tech. And uh, I have a good technical undergrad. And in future, I want to uh, start a tech focused on a uh, startup. So. Uh, 
if we lose him. Maybe he'll rejoin and we can come back to him. Um, let me try to very quickly address the questions that we've got in the chat. I'll just go down from top to bottom um, and then we can get back to answering questions um, verbally. Um, so let me see. So from right, Sandeep. I have one ahead. question, which I think from the chat itself, but because I've spoken to you, I For think sure. this would be interesting which is about the round of application. And uh, I think you have a different opinion on the round one, round two, and round three. Uh, with your personal experience, I think everyone would love to hear that. That would be really sure. Sure. Um, so I was a round three admin, which is the most difficult round to get in. Uh, the I, I don't know ex the exact acceptance rate, but it's ridiculously low. Um, I have no idea how I got in, but <laughs> um, I do strongly recommend that people apply Round one and round two, you know, round one, all the seats are open. They're looking for really anyone who's smart and meets the criteria. It's largely the same for round two, except certain categories may already be full. Let me explain what I mean by certain categories. You know, MIT doesn't only want smart army logistics officers. Once they already have two or three smart army logistics officers, no matter how smart you are, they're not going to let you in. They've already filled the seats. So the longer you wait, the higher the risk that your the seats for the category that you sit in have already been filled. So if you wait until round three, you are hoping that your seats are still open. I happen to be lucky, and for whatever reason, they felt they, they were okay to have one more veteran. Um, but it could very much have not been the case, and I would have missed out in that case. So again, early is important. Um, that being said, don't apply until your application is ready, until it's, it's at least you're 95% comfortable with it. Um, so don't force yourself. It is better to apply round three, be rejected and apply again the next year than it is to not apply at all because it'll show loyalty and sincere passion for the school. Hope that answers it. Yeah. Um, I'm fine, yeah. actually, if you want to if moderate do, the questions in the chat, it. or if you want me to just go ahead and, and go down from top to bottom. You, yeah, you, please, please, please. Yeah, okay. you can just take anything that you want to answer. Yeah. Let, let me do a speed round and, and give quick answers. Um, single biggest missed opportunity or mistake when applying. I think it goes back to what I mentioned earlier. Um, one, not not showing your genuine self. And number two, creating large, unpractical, unre unrealistic future career plans. That rings of someone who is putting a mask on and also over planning their life. Uh, so be passionate, be genuine. It doesn't need to be some save the world type of idea. So simple is better than perfect. Um, simple and genuine, I should say. Hi, uh, MIT. Okay, this is about the inner, the video interview and the organizational chart. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to address, be able to address all parts of this question, um, especially since I don't know what stuff is happening in the last two years since COVID. But um, for the video interview and the organizational chart, let's take them one by one. Video interview, the point of this is to, again, get to that collaborative piece that I mentioned earlier, that fourth factor. They want to make sure you're, the, you're a friendly person who doesn't have a difficulty speaking and interacting with other humans, <laughs> right? Being a tech school, they want to make sure that they don't get engineers who are afraid of actually interacting with people. So show your human side, um, show your personality. We want to see someone who's able to uh, be friendly, collaborative, and and able to make friends. Essentially, uh, that's what the inter the video interview is really checking for. Org chart. This is something where they they want to understand, um, especially for people who might have leadership experience, where you sat in the organization. Are you really an individual contributor at the bottom of the organization chart, or are you actually supervising people and how many dotted lines do you have where you have to work with people on the same level as you? So again, that plays into multiple features, but if you're someone who's completely isolated in an individual contributor role, 
it's far less likely that you're going to be collaborative or able to work with people around you. Or if you don't have any subordinates, you might not have leadership experience that you can share with your classmates. You don't need to have all of those things. Most people don't. Most people either have leadership or collaboration, and some people don't have either. But I think they want to understand where the, to bucket you. Are you someone who they are bringing in for your depth of leadership experience because you can share that? Or at least are you someone who is very collaborative and can work with the people around you? So, you know, you want to show your relationships on the org organizational chart. Don't just put your box with a single line to the top. Use that as a way of showing how collaborative you are. Put dotted lines to the other people that you're interacting with. Show how you might have informal subordinates who are reporting to you. So really it's show where you sit in the organization and who you actually talk to on a daily basis. Make sure that that is demonstrated on the org chart. I hope that answers the question. Let me move down. Um, okay, difference, whether you apply in round one or round two, there's a slight difference, but largely most of the seats and categories will be open between round one and round two. There's a slight preference for round one, but it's not large enough to force you to do a round one application if you aren't ready. If you are ready, I do recommend round one. If you're not really ready, don't don't worry about it and apply in round two. Um, and let's move on. Sectors I've worked as a consultant and then how easy or difficult to work in one sector versus another and how do you prepare? Um, I've worked in three or four sectors, a little bit of automotive, consumer products has been the area I've spent most of my time. Um, within that beverages, cosmetics, apparel, uh, and a little bit of FinTech and also some healthcare and pharmaceutical. I mean, every project is different you're always having to dive in without any depth of knowledge. Most of the time, you won't know what you're talking about when you start. So again, it's it's a expert for a day model. You really have to be quick at learning and understanding and how to grasp a new market dynamic. Mostly we do that by paying for very expensive expert interviews. $1,000 an hour, we get on the phone with someone who uh, has 20 years, 30 years of experience in the business, and we do 10 of those interviews. After that, you will kind of understand how the market works. Um, so it's not really something that you can prepare for an MBA. Just learn how to be flexible, read quickly, and um, be comfortable having an opinion before you know everything. You have to learn how to skate on thin ice. Not no ice, but enough knowledge that you can at least um, show you have some uh, something to share of value for a client. Um, for Elizabeth's question, I'm going to save that to the end because it's pretty broad and, you know, asking about my role in a strategy company. I think my role is very similar to any other senior manager in a strategy firm, and there's quite a lot of material. If we have time at the end, we can come back to that. Um, how did Sloan help in building the social muscle? I mean, it's a very vibrant campus with events every day, um, organized events and informal events. Uh, they force you into a core team as well, where you have five other classmates who are supposed to be your MBA family. So essentially, you don't have an option to go off into a corner alone and hide. That will not be allowed. You are forced out of your comfort zone. You need to connect with the other five or six members on your core team at least. And then you should also be connecting with the other members of your ocean. Uh, this is a bit of MIT lingo, but they divide up the 400 students into different 60 to 70 student large oceans, which are larger groups. And you need to be attending events that are organized around those groups. So, you know, just even by attending only the formally organized events, you will get more experience in, in working with people and in building those relationships. Sloan Fellows versus two-year MBA. There is a difference. Sloan Fellows is good program. I respect the Sloan Fellows, but the, uh, the two-year MBA is still acknowledged as the gold standard. The requirements for admissions are different, much tougher, the two-year MBA, and it has the strongest prestige. I mean, it's considered the true MBA. Again, if you're later in your career with 10 to 12 years experience, um, that's what Sloan Fellows is really designed for. It's not meant to be that first two-year uh, rough experience that's molding you 
a Sloan Fellows is more of a finishing school, right? So you need to be someone that has enough of experience and professional um, depth that you're able to come into that and benefit from that type of finishing school. So it's just a fundamentally different type of program. But, you know, it, it's a different pathway than having attended MIT much earlier in your career and going through that rigorous two-year program. Uh, so it is different, and the two-year MBA is more intense. But again, this is not to say anything negative about Sloan Fellows. It's a slightly different type of program with a different purpose. What would a reapplicant focus on? Um, two things. I, I think you would focus on number one, the fact that you're a reapplicant is showing how passionate you are and how much you really want to be at this program. Number one. Um, number two, um, you will want to explain how your application is different than it was before. Um, and, and what else you have that will change the value proposition for you being on campus? What are you newly able to bring to the table and, and to your classmates? So I, I think it's really those two things. You know, there's some things in your application you just can't change. And that's there's nothing you can do about that. Um, but you can show the depth of your passion and you can show where you have grown or adjusted in the, in the year since you previously applied. Uh, what clubs was I a part of? Very quickly, um, I put most of my energy into two clubs, one being the uh, Japan Business Club, because again, I wanted to connect with my other Japanese classmates um, and prepare myself for going back to Japan. And number two, Asian Business Club, for the same reasons, but I for Asian Business Club, we put on a conference each year, so Asian Business Conference. And for this, I was able to take a leadership role um, that is also good for my resume when I'm applying to roles back in Asia. Um, I actually got my internship through that conference. Um, I met the board member that I mentioned previously from Suntory who was speaking at that event and, and um, marketed myself to him there. So um, those are the two main clubs that I was a part of. Um, there were other things as well. I was part of the analytics course track, uh, which has its own kind of special social events, et cetera. Um, and it's not a club, but I started a company when I was there with two classmates. So kind of making your own club. Uh, and you can also start your own clubs for any focused activity. Uh, I do think it's good not to only do professional clubs, but also some social things. You want to connect with your classmates as friends and people, not only as quote unquote business persons. Um, so essentially this question is how are people connected after the MBA um, and how do they help each other? Um, a couple ways. It's a very tight community. Uh, the most literal and direct way is that I have we have one big WhatsApp group for everyone in class of 2018. And whenever someone needs something, they just post it there. And people will DM with resources or they'll get on a call uh, to talk about their industry. Um, so very literally, you have direct access to all of your classmates. Um, I think more broadly, I mean, there's MIT Sloan events here in Japan. There's MIT alumni, not only Sloan, but the entire ecosystem events here that I attend. And I meet people who are in senior positions across many industries. Um, so that's all there. Um, and I mean, it's a strong community. There's, there's not, I don't think we have time to go too much deeper into it. Tech related entrepreneurship. How would I rate MIT? Um, very strongly. Um, the program that Bill Ouellette runs is impressive. Um, they cite this statistic a lot, but I think if you put all of MIT's startups together, it would be like the fifth largest economy in the world or something like that. Um, it's extremely strong how they bring the engineering program together with the business school to create companies. Uh, so I do think it's a, one of the world standard uh, for this. It is very much yeah, similar to Stanford, I would also put Stanford up there as top of the world, but I think together Stanford and MIT are some of the best for uh, tech entrepreneurship. How to move between geographies. Um, I will say that moving out of the US is very different than if you want to move into the US. Um, you know, via, to the US it's always a visa game. 
unfortunately. I, I, I'm not a deep expert on that, so I won't comment on it further. Um, but I think that you need to be ready for a struggle no matter what geography you're trying to shift to. The NBA will help you get a role, certainly, um, but not all roles offers visa sponsorship. Um, in my case, I used the NBA experience um, as a way to show interest in the region I wanted to move to and then use it as a platform to network with people there. Almost anyone is willing to talk to an MIT MBA student versus someone who's working at a random company. So it gives you a reason to email random people um, in, in the desired geography you want to go to. So use that to the best of your ability. The partner I work with today here in my consulting firm, I just randomly emailed her on LinkedIn um, five years ago. Uh, and she took my call uh, just as a random M MBA student. So these, you do have power and ability, use it. Um, grading methodology, just 10 seconds. Um, it's out of a five point scale. Most people get either Bs or As. Academics are not really the focus. Don't be an idiot and don't skip stuff. Like do your work, but don't make it perfect. I actually say you're missing out if you get a perfect perfect grade. You should be spending time with your classmates, creating new companies, learning with your hands. Don't focus on getting a perfect score. Get something B, B plus. I think that's about where you want to be for an MBA. It's a different mindset from other um, countries. People coming from Asia are sh might be shocked to hear that. But again, the score doesn't matter at this point. No one knows what your grade is. Get to know your classmates. Learn, learn by doing. Um, let me see. I think we've got to the end of the questions. Yeah. Um, so any last thoughts from the moderating team? Yeah, I think uh, we would all like to know. So moving ahead, what is your plan? So how long do you plan to stay in Japan? Or what is your future uh, aspirations? Do you plan to move to another geography or anything, anything that you have in mind? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I do intend Japan to be my base. So geographically speaking, I won't be leaving Japan anytime soon. Um, from a role and job perspective, at least for the short term, I do expect uh, consulting to be an industry I stay in. I love the variety. I love jumping from one subsector to another subsector. I love the freedom that it brings for me to choose who I talk to and who I work with and not really have a boss who's chasing me. You know, I, I determine how I spend my days for the most part. Um, of course, it's busy. Fine projects are tough, um, but the um, the speed at which you learn and the I think the speed at which you gain new capabilities is unparalleled, and I'm not ready to step away from the roller coaster yet. Um, there is a question down the road if I want to take on some type of an executive role. That's certainly an option. Um, I spent a little bit of time as an executive at uh, Crack in the Digital asset exchange, um, that has its own set of exhilaration um, because you are truly in the decision-making seat and you own the P&L statement. Um, so maybe down the road, I'll take on Japan office for one of these companies, but who knows? For now, I'm, I'm really enjoying the consulting uh, industry. And I think, again, it comes back to when you're in an economy like Japan or some of the emerging market economies, I think you really see your impact much more than you do in the U.S., where you're kind of, you know, it's a very mature market. So you're helping them shave off a little bit more on the margin. That's about it. You're not creating new products. You're not uh, revolutionizing anything the way you are in the, the more developing regions. Um, Ashta and Amar, do you have any closing remarks that you'd like to tell Randy before we wrap this up? And then I will just wrap up in the end after you speak. Is there anything you want to add? No, I think it's been great, Randy. Like, uh, it was really insightful. And uh, MIT, honestly, is uh, the dream B school for a lot of us. So uh, it was really great to, uh, you know, listen to your experiences. And thank you so much for your time. Yeah, yes. my pleasure. I, you know, hope everyone could get something valuable out of the session. Uh, apologies for running late. Uh, I'm not sure if it's because I'm a slow speaker or 
Um, we were just having too much fun, but um, I hope it's useful. Um, Sloan is a great community. I know it, it's tough applying to schools. Um, very demoralizing when you get rejections. Um, do your best to maintain faith, have trust in yourself, your abilities, and um, that something will work out. For most people, it does, as long as you apply yourself um, the right way and, and tell your genuine story. So good luck to you all. Um, I, I genuinely hope you can all fulfill your dreams. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you Randy. Thank you, for, thank you so much for giving, your time, giving us your time. And uh, we hope to stay in touch with you. I mean, uh, if we have another session, we might contact you. So, I so, mean... Uh, uh, we are really thankful, everybody. I mean, the entire community is very, very thankful to you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you again. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye.